Hey folks, welcome back to Military Forces Unleashed. Today, we're diving into one of the most fascinating stories in modern naval warfare, France's new Defense and Intervention Frigate, better known as the FDI class. This isn't just another warship, it's a technological marvel designed to redefine how navies operate in the 21st century. In this episode, we'll explore the Amaral Ronark, the first ship in the FDI program, its cutting edge tech, modular armament, and why it might be the blueprint for future frigates worldwide. Get ready because we're about to unpack everything that makes this vessel so special, and maybe even a little overhyped. Imagine a ship so advanced it could track every drone, missile, and submarine within 500 kilometers, all while updating its software mid-mission. Sounds too good to be true? Well, buckle up, because the French Navy is betting big on this futuristic design. But here's the kicker. Despite all the hype, there are some glaring weaknesses you won't hear about in glossy press releases. So stick around. We'll break down what works, what doesn't, and whether this $700 million gamble will pay off. To understand the FDI, we need to rewind to the Cold War era when frigates were essentially glorified escorts. They weren't glamorous. They didn't pack much punch compared to destroyers or cruisers. Their job was simple, protect bigger ships from submarines and aircraft. Fast forward to today, and naval warfare has evolved dramatically. The rise of asymmetric threats like small drone boats, suicide vessels, and cyber attacks has forced designers to rethink the entire concept of a frigate. The concept of multi-purpose frigates isn't new to Europe. In fact, ships like Germany's Bremen class in the 1980s and France's Lafayette class in the 1990s laid the groundwork for versatile warships capable of handling anti-submarine, anti-air, and surface warfare missions. But these ships had limitations. Outdated electronics, limited range, and poor adaptability to emerging threats. Enter the FDI, a bold attempt to leapfrog past those constraints entirely. So what makes the FDI stand out? First, let's talk size. At 121 meters long and displacing 4,700 tons, it's compact but still packs a serious punch. For comparison, that's slightly smaller than America's Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, but far more versatile. It's designed to carry systems like the Exocet MM-40 anti-ship missiles, Aster air defense missiles, and MU-90 torpedoes, with modularity allowing mission-specific configurations. Oh, and did I mention it carries a 10-ton helicopter and a drone? Yeah, this thing is loaded. But the real star of the show is the Thales Seafire radar, with four fixed panels operating in the S-band and providing 360-degree coverage it's like having eyes everywhere, but with unparalleled precision and range. Combine that with its digital architecture, featuring two redundant virtualized data centers, and you've got a ship that can process insane amounts of information in real time. Think of it as a floating supercomputer armed with enough firepower to take on an entire flotilla. Now let's geek out a bit. Remember how I mentioned cyber threats earlier? The FDI is the first French warship natively protected against hacking attempts. Its IT architecture is split into two brains. If one gets a headache, the other keeps things running smoothly. It's basically fail-safe computing at sea. And then there's the gateway system for combating asymmetric threats. Picture this, a swarm of small, fast-moving boats armed with explosives heading straight for you. Most ships would struggle to coordinate defenses quickly enough, not the FDI. Its gateway system integrates sensors, weapons, and decision-making tools to neutralize threats before they get close. It's like playing whack-a-mole, but with missiles and machine guns. Okay, now for the elephant in the room. Is the FDI really worth it? Sure, it sounds impressive on paper, but reality often tells a different story. First, there's the cost. Each FDI comes with a price tag north of 700 million euros. For context, 
That's almost double the cost of Germany's Braunschweig-class Corvettes, which are arguably just as effective in many scenarios. While early trials have identified some challenges with integrating the Sea Fire radar into the ship's combat system, there's no substantial evidence of widespread false positive issues at this stage. And don't even get me started on maintenance costs. Those fancy data centers, they require specialized crews and constant updates, which means higher operational expenses. Critics argue that the FDI tries to do too much. By cramming every possible feature into one platform, Naval Group may have created a jack of all trades, but master of none. Others counter that flexibility is key in modern warfare. The truth? Probably somewhere in between. At the end of the day, the FDI represents both ambition and risk. On one hand, it showcases what's possible when you combine advanced technology with innovative design. On the other, it highlights the dangers of over-engineering. Will it revolutionize naval warfare? Maybe, but only time will tell if it lives up to the hype. What's clear is that the FDI sets a precedent for future warships. Countries like Greece, which ordered six units, clearly see value in its multi-role capabilities. Whether other nations follow suit remains to be seen. One thing's certain, the race to build smarter, deadlier, and more adaptable warships is far from over. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the FDI frigate, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe for more military content. Drop a comment below. What specific trade-offs would you make between cutting-edge technology and operational reliability when designing a modern warship? And hey, if you could redesign any part of the FDI, what would it be? Thanks for tuning in, folks. Your support keeps this channel sailing strong. Until next time, stay sharp and keep exploring the high seas of military history.